water, the source of all life. Rivers, the wellsprings of civilization. The roof of the world, the vast hinterland of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, home to the glaciers that nourish and sustain three mighty rivers whose waters sustain the lives of more than a billion people living in six different countries. Whether you go upstream along the Yangtze River, Yellow River and Lansang River, whether you cross the Chinese mainland or go up the Indo-Chinese peninsula, no matter what, the end point is always the same. Qinghai, China. And one place in particular, sandwiched between the Tangu La and Kunlun Mountains, 4,700 meters above sea level, the source of those three mega rivers, San Zheng Yuan. Here, from the glaciers, rivers, wetlands, and swamps of this area, some 50 billion cubic meters of water makes its way into those rivers on a yearly basis. But San Zhengyuan, in other ways, is a region whose almost unrivaled highland biodiversity is extremely sensitive to climate change. San Zhengyuan, 300,000 square kilometers of plateau, home to 370 species of animals, 2,200 kinds of plants, and nearly 600,000 people. San Zhengyuan a region upon which the health of the great rivers that sustain the lives of everyone in China, the most populous nation on earth, depends. San Zhengyuan, by any measure, an important, unique place of the utmost ecological significance. Gerla Dain Dong Peak, towering 6,621 meters above sea level, is the tallest mountain in the Tangula Mountains, but it's just one of 20 snow-capped mountains with altitudes exceeding 6,000 meters. In this stretch of nearly 1,500 square kilometers of mountain range, 670 square kilometers are covered in ice and snow. Here, the valleys and canyons are home to more than 100 modern glaciers, the largest one of which, the Jiang Di Ru Glacier, is the source of the Tuo Tuo River, the first stretch of the Yangtze. Gerla Dain Dong in January. Just now, everything here, even time itself, seems frozen. But when spring arrives, life will start afresh. At last, San Zheng Yuan's frozen winter has ended. As the glaciers start to thaw, the young otter mother can't wait to teach the little one two essential life skills, swimming and fishing. In freshwater ecosystems, otters have few natural enemies. Because of their need to prey on a great quantity of fish and shrimp, the presence of otters is seen as an indicator of river water quality. Only the purest waters can sustain a population of otters. But naturally, the baby otter is afraid of water. It only begins to learn to swim with its mother six weeks after its birth.
and its fur isn't yet thick and smooth enough for it to be about to switch freely between land and water. Sanjeng Yuan in early spring sees water temperature rise to around zero degrees while the temperature on land remains close to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Besides the effect of the bone-chilling wind, sunlight also causes the little otter problems. Wild otters are nocturnal, rarely leaving their burrows during the day. Seeing its baby begging for mercy, the otter mother has to give up. Fortunately, otters are naturally restless. The little otter turns his mind to new sources of fun in next to no time. When black-necked cranes honk, Sanjeng Yuan enters its short spring. They're the only cranes that live on the plateau all year round. Every year, at the end of March, they return to San Zheng Yuan in groups from their wintering grounds. Also coming back at the same time are bar-headed geese. They're known for being able to migrate over the Himalayas, always returning to San Zheng Yuan to bring forth the next generation. But the mating season is brief. Single black-necked cranes need to hurry up and find a mate. The prize goes to whoever dances more elegantly and sings more beautifully. As the temperature continues to rise, the ice and snow continues to thaw, exposing sands, soil and grass, enlivening the plateau still more. The white-rumped snow finch is a species endemic to the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. But don't let its petite and cute appearance deceive you. It's very aggressive. In fact, they're happy to fight with each other till the cows come home. But though they're good at running and hopping, they can't fly too high. The world may be vast, but they can only see the opponents right in front of them. This is a nest of albino Himalayan marmots. They're also yearning for spring. For Himalayan marmots, spring is a fleeting affair. As soon as the seven month long hibernation ends, the tense and short mating season starts. Marmots have a low reproductive rate only one litter a year, with half of the young dying during lactation. Because some female marmots mate with multiple male marmots in the course of a single day, the mating season is highly competitive.
While two male marmots are busy battling it out, the initiator of the battle basks in the sun in her front yard. Marmots are large rodents with just the same cleft lips as hares. They also have two pairs of sharp incisors that can easily bite off the roots and stems of plants and serve as powerful weapons, both for offense and defense. Look carefully, they're not kissing each other, they're wrestling. In ancient Chinese mythology, the Kunlun Mountains are holy, the abode of the gods. In reality, Ho Xiu, at the southern foot of the Kunlun Mountains, is the source area of the Chuma River, which flows into the Yangtze from the north. The Zhuonai Lake here, in particular, is a mecca for one species. All these female Tibetan antelopes are pregnant. Over a month ago, they set off from all over the Qinghai Tibet Plateau and traveled hundreds of kilometers to give birth here. Scientists haven't yet deciphered this phenomenon. However, in summer, the frozen ground around Zhuonai Lake thaws, resulting in muddy roads. Other animals are seldom seen here. But that doesn't mean that this place is a safe haven free of predators. A wolf has followed the antelopes here and killed a newly born. A long journey has led to a tragic end. The sad truth is that the birthing season is when wild animals are most vulnerable. This Tibetan antelope is about to give birth. It's restless, walking back and forth, frequently sitting down and standing up. For now, these Tibetan antelopes are remaining very calm. Their main priority is grazing, so as to store up as much energy as they can for the upcoming tug of war. It's an incredible scene. On this large hillside by the Zhuonai Lake, over a thousand Tibetan antelopes are collectively waiting for the most important moment in their lives. is unusually quiet amidst the sound of the wind and soft moaning of the antelopes. The slightest disturbance would spook them. After half an hour of painful contractions, this female Tibetan antelope is finally ready to give birth. The calf's head is first to appear. The doe continues to sit, stand and sit again, using the squatting position to help herself.
Ah, let's hope this is the last time she has to stand up. Finally, the calf is completely free of its mother's body. But with the odors released by the birthing process filling the air, the risk of attracting predators is very high. The doe licks the calf's body constantly, eating the afterbirth and biting off the umbilical cord. She needs to help the calf stand up as quickly as possible, teaching it to walk and run. Usually about 10 minutes after the birth, the little antelope can shakily stand up. Within half an hour, it can play happily with its mother. Speaking of the hardships of parenting, let's get to know another great mother. She might be completely blind in one eye, but this Tibetan fox is still a great hunter. This year she became a new mother with five cubs. It's far from common for Tibetan foxes to have a litter of five. The little ones were born in spring. By early summer, they can finally come out to run, jump and play. For the mother fox, this creates new challenges. First of all, with five cubs around, the hole she dug earlier is too small. It needs to be expanded. But if she focuses on digging, she won't be able to look after them. In this vast grassland, danger is lurking everywhere. Secondly, the little foxes are very aggressive, so much so that they often beat each other up. Win or lose, they run to their mother for comfort in the end. The biggest headache is feeding. All five cubs are still breastfeeding. Feeding five mouths in turn is quite a heavy burden. Why is this little guy suddenly stopped eating? A little bit more. Better not force it. Plus, it's time to give this front leg a rest. And in order to have enough milk to feed the cubs, the mother fox has to eat more food herself. Her main food sources are small alert animals like marmots and peekers on the grasslands. But with five playful young cubs playing around, even if prey does present itself, the mother fox is hardly in any position to do anything about it. Hang on, don't move. Here comes a pika. Seems mom will go hungry again. Not that the little foxes know anything about that. Ah, for the carefree days of youth.
Every year, at the turn of spring and summer, the southwest warm and humid airflow driven by the monsoon brings abundant precipitation to the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. That's why San Zhengyuan also enters its wet season at this time. The rain falls on more than 70,000 square kilometers of wetlands here, which serve as a huge reservoir. These large and small wetlands absorb water from all directions like soft sponges and then deliver it to rivers through surface and underground runoff. In addition to conserving water sources, wetlands are also a cradle of biodiversity, a paradise for a variety of birds, fish and amphibians. When July is approaching, a baby black-necked crane sees its parents for the first time. Black-necked cranes are precocious developers. Just a single day after hatching, the little crane is ready to leave the nest. It's covered with yellow down, completely lacking the elegance and mystery of its parents. However, taking these two steps does require some talent. In the breeding season, security is everything, which is why black-necked cranes usually build their nests in wetlands or swamps that are inaccessible to terrestrial animals. They collect dead branches and grasses to build their nests. Outside the breeding period, they usually dispense with the need for a nest entirely. But once a baby crane is born, they instantly transform themselves into devoted nursing parents. If one parent has to go out for food, the other always stays behind to look after the baby. This little black-necked crane has now learned to swim. Next, it'll learn how to fly. In just over two months, when fall arrives, it'll embark on a long journey with its parents. In July, the annual breeding season of Tibetan antelopes comes to an end. The does are ready to leave the mountain foot with the calves, but first they have to wade through the wide, shallow and messy riverbeds of the Chuma River. The Chuma River is the northern source of the Yangtze River, originating from the mountains in Ho Xil that constitute the southern Kunlun. Its upstream stretch flows through the Ho Shil grasslands, which sit above a minimum altitude of over 4,500 meters. One of the coldest regions in China, an enormous amount of water is stored here in the snowy mountains and frozen ground along the riverbanks. But in summer, Ho Shil is covered in green, abounding with lakes and streams. A large quantity of water from thawing ice and snow as well as groundwater is released into the Chuma River via the southern slopes of the Kunlun Mountains. This migration route seems to be engraved in the minds of Tibetan antelopes. Even a newly born calf seems familiar with it. In fact, this calf looks like it's just waking up from a dream. It only decides to look for its mother after crossing the river with the majority of the antelopes. Aged barely a month, and already they have to brace themselves for a long journey ahead. Right now, the most important thing is to eat as much as possible to build up their strength. But just as the antelopes are getting ready to go, a wolf turns up. Blending perfectly into the grassland, the wolf stealthily approaches. Mm. 
suddenly, the wolf launches its attack. The does leading the calves run quickly toward the other side of the river. The calves can run very fast shortly after birth. As long as they're not targeted by the wolf, they have a high chance of escaping. But one calf is not so lucky. The wolf doesn't intend to enjoy the food alone. It picks up its prey and runs home. Midsummer is the most charming season of all in San Zheng Yuan. Along the magnificent rivers and beneath the sprawling clouds, trees and grass grow in luxuriance. It's time for the marmots to put on some weight. Look, that Himalayan marmot is really getting stuck in, as if it knows that the good stuff won't last for long. Marmots, the largest of the squirrel family, feed on grass, berries and wildflowers. In San Zheng Yuan's summer, grass is tender and juicy, a genuinely delicious and nutritious treat for these creatures. It's a golden opportunity for these marmots to build up fat reserves in their bodies for the hibernation season in two months' time. The cubs of the one-eyed Tibetan fox have now grown up their immature looks giving way to the robust physique and vigilant bearing of adult foxes. But of the five newborns, only three survived. What's more, the injured right eye of the mother fox shows no sign of recovery. Having learned about the harshness of nature, they have to mature earlier than their peers. For seemingly no reason at all, two plateau peakers are having a fight with each other. But judging from their chubby bodies and short limbs, their squabble is really nothing but a show of strength. Peakers are well-known gluttons. In fact, they are more than capable of devouring half their body weight of grass every day. But they are experts in burrowing as well as eating. What's more, the burrows they dig provide shelter for many other small animals, like ground-dwelling birds. As they burrow, they bring large amounts of soft soil to the surface, providing a rare habitat for insects, lizards and other small mammals. Where you get peekers, you are sure to find plenty of other animals too. But not all the animals that follow the peekers are welcomed by the peekers themselves. The peekers might be happy to provide other creatures with a home or habitat, but they're not so keen to provide them with a meal. In San Zheng Yuan, predators, large and small, keep their eyes on the peekers. Danger for the peekers can come in any direction, including from the air. To avoid these predators, Peekers live in open areas covered with low vegetation, but that can only provide them limited protection. This time, the one-eyed mother fox is expanding her burrow. She's looking for food, or more precisely, looking for peekers. Despite stuffing its long, thin mouth and half of her body down the hole, she still fails to get hold of the peeker that just appeared. What a frustrating afternoon. In San Zheng Yuan's summer, rain can come at any time. If the fox is not to starve, she must get whatever food she can before the rain gets heavier. Once again, she senses her prey and strikes. Beep, beep, beep. 
but there's no chance for her to enjoy the hard-won prey right away. There are three cubs weaned and hungry, waiting for her to bring food home. Of all the foods consumed by the Tibetan fox, 95% are plateau pikas. Learning to find and hunt pikas is a must for the young Tibetan foxes. The Tibetan fox is a solitary animal of the canine family. Outside the breeding and mating season, they are the lone rangers of the plateau. Soon, the three cubs will have to try to make their own way in the world. It's been a tough summer, but the mother has managed to raise three babies, even though she only has one eye. Now, she's cherishing the last moment of intimacy with her children. Autumn comes to San Zhengyuan suddenly, the vegetation turning yellowish and the forest becoming colorful seemingly overnight. Many animals are scrambling to hoard food or to accumulate fat. Autumn in San Zhengyuan is very short and winter is approaching inexorably. The young black-necked crane is rapidly growing up. The parents have already taught it to walk, swim, hunt. Now the time has come to train it to fly. At last, the young crane makes it. Now it's ready to follow the flock to fly south. As the temperature drops, the marshes and wetlands in San Zhengyuan gradually freeze over, leaving the water birds less and less space to forage and making it easier for land animals such as wolves and foxes to approach them. Before leaving, the birds huddle in the area that still hasn't frozen over, searching for food to build up energy reserves for the long journey ahead. Winter brings life here to a temporary halt. The first heavy snow of winter in this land usually falls in November. In winter, the average daily temperature outdoors drops rapidly below zero, and the highest temperature at noon does not exceed 10 degrees Celsius. The once vibrant San Zhengyuan turns cold and quiet. The water begins to freeze. In this silent and harsh environment, it's an extreme challenge for the animals to survive. So much so that even the snow leopard, king of the highlands, is suffering. Snow leopards are masters of stealth. Whether they're on the grass, in the jungle, or under cliffs, the color of their hair provides them with ideal camouflage. In this shot, a snow leopard is lurking in the grass. Can you find it? It has just hunted a barrel and had its first big meal in days. Now it's figuring out what to do with the rest of its hard-won bounty. A red fox is approaching, following the bloody scent. The smell gets stronger. The feast is just around the corner. The red fox spots the leopard.
As the red fox draws close, a magpie flies over. Chasing snow leopards for scraps of food for most of the year, they are now emboldened. The snow leopard has no intention of giving it a share, nor of driving it away. Until there's another foray on its hard-won prey, that is. The snow leopard finally loses patience. Nearby are several vultures, infamous scavengers that live on carcasses. They too are coveting the snow leopard's prey. Realizing that it is impossible to relish the food in peace, the snow leopard goes away reluctantly, leaving behind a scene of chaos. Scarcity of food and volatile weather are posing challenges to all the species in the region. But for some, it's the most exciting season of the year, mating season. This male white-lipped deer is courting. No species of deer lives at a higher altitude than the white-lipped deer a species unique to the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. They are large with thick, stocky back hair. In season, the males usually become very thin due to poor appetite and their temperament turns fierce. This male Tibetan antelope is also looking for a mate. Female Tibetan antelopes spend half the year either giving birth or preparing to. It is not only the breeding season in winter that males and females begin to mix with each other. The males strive to win over the largest number of females and create a harem. Usually, a male Tibetan antelope gathers 10 to 20 females. But several challenges have been hanging around, and the females are unwilling to comply. The males will have to show each other up to win some hearts. The Tibetan antelope deserves to be called the flagship species of San Zheng Yuan and even the whole Qinghai Tibet Plateau. Despite living 4,000 meters above sea level with scarce oxygen, they can run at speeds of up to 80 kilometers an hour, even in the depths of winter. The first challenger drops out of the race, but a second challenger soon takes the stage. Tibetan antelopes have exceptionally wide nasal passages and mouths. A small sac in each nostril helps them breathe easily in the thin air of the plateau. The horns of male Tibetan antelopes are about 60 centimeters long and covered by thick and tough transverse ridges with tips pointing upwards as their natural weapons. Driven by male hormones every year, Tibetan antelopes fight to the death in pursuit of mating rights. Even if they don't die, many break their horns like this. As a broken horn cannot regenerate, it's safe to say that this Tibetan antelope will permanently lose the right to mate and reproduce. Yeah. 
the adolescent calf born last year has joined in. Usually, male Tibetan antelopes must wait until they are at least two and a half years old before they are mature enough to mate for the first time. The winner drives the young pretender away. Now he has fully displayed his masculine charm and bravery. But the females are still not fully convinced. The male has to show more, just a little more. On the prairie, the smell of hormones is getting stronger and stronger. The females are finally conquered. There it is. Mission accomplished. Tibetan antelopes have adapted their mating strategy to a cold climate and a habitat surrounded by natural enemies. Although they only mate for a few seconds at a time, the mating period lasts for more than 20 days. Males and females mate repeatedly during this period to improve the chances of conception. At the end of the mating period, the males part with their mates, who, by the following spring, will start migration, as they have been doing for thousands of years, with new lives in their bellies. As long as the mountains and rivers remain, the cycle of life will continue in San Zhengyuan, year after year, until the end of time. <laughs>